Over the past few months, we enlisted the help of some of the world's best players. We're talking household names here, all with one goal in mind. Put together the most accurate tier list for the launch of The War Within Season 1. While you were pushing your rating at the end of Dragonflight, enjoying all the wonders that pre-patch had to offer, and spending twice as much money just to keep the FOMO at bay, sorry, I meant get a head start on the new season, these top players have been vigorously wargaming day and night, testing specs, trying out hero talents, theorizing builds, you name it, we tested it. And that's why we're thrilled to announce the launch of our brand new class courses for The War Within tailor-made alongside these same top players to give you everything you could ever need to reach your goals this expansion, including a deep dive into the new hero talents, a look at how to maximize your sustained damage rotation, a walkthrough of the ultimate burst sequences, and so, so much more. If this weren't enough, we're even rolling out brand new updates and improvements to our revolutionary add-on, which gives you everything you could ever need to climb to Gladiator and, dare I say it, rank 1. There's no better time to join Skillcap. Don't believe us? Well, everything we offer is backed up by one simple promise, that you will gain at least 400 rating while using our service or your money back. Simple. We continue to offer this because Skillcap has helped over half a million players just like you reach their PvP goals. So if you want to skip the guesswork and get an exclusive early season discount, all while supporting your favorite content creator, me, be sure to visit the links in the description below. Let's kick things off with a spec you probably forgot even existed, Frost Death Knight. When I think of Frost Death Knight, I imagine a spec that should in theory be simple and straightforward to play. Buttons glow, you press them, and you deal high damage. Unholy has always been about spreading high sustained damage with dots and pets, while Frost should focus on high direct damage, at least that's how I picture them anyway. However, somewhere along the line, Frost has strayed far from that simplicity, becoming one of the most setup dependent specs in the entire game, relying on strict timers and flawless coordination with your team every minute to execute setups where everybody needs to contribute and be on the same page. And if you don't secure a kill during this, you might as well be invisible for the next 60 seconds. Which, as you probably can imagine, being reliant on any form of coordination from your team in solo shuffle, period, isn't exactly a recipe for success. Well, you'll be happy to hear this is now changed in the war within. Instead of being reliant on a coordinated setup every 60 seconds, it's now 45 seconds instead! Fantastic! This is mainly due to the current go-to hero talent tree shaping up to be Deathbringer with the main hook being the ability Reaper's Mark, a powerful debuff that once applied to the target will gain stacks every time the target takes frost damage, exploding once it hits 40, dealing absolutely ridiculous damage. But come on, it's Arena in 2024, the second Reaper's Mark gets used, even your opponent's next door neighbors will end up knowing. Nonetheless, while Frost DK still retains much of the same setup based playstyle, there has admittedly been some slight improvements to their sustained damage. To put it this way, players will at least be able to tell you're on them now. Anyway, despite this, Frost Death Knight is ultimately a spec that tends to perform much better at lower ratings. The higher you climb, however, the more you'll find yourself at the mercy of the lobby. All things considered though, there's no denying that they're still in a better spot this expansion. As such, we'll be placing Frost DK straight into our B tier. Up next, we have the spec with undoubtedly the coolest looking hero tree of them all. Looking being the keyword here. Unholy Death Knight. If you played Unholy Death Knight in Dragonflight, hopefully you enjoyed the playstyle, as in The War Within, they're, well, exactly the same. In fact, with Strangulate replacing Asphyxiate and Virulent Plague being merged into Dark Transformation, there's now actually less buttons than before. The playstyle still revolves entirely around the consistent high damage of your diseases, death coil, and popping your wounds, coupled with some huge bursts in the opener by summoning all of your pets and popping Unholy Assault. Then after that, relying on mini goes and micro CC to close out the game, only now with more passive pets, more sustained damage, and way more survivability as what's shaping up to be the go-to talent tree is Rider of the Apocalypse, which grants Death Knight a random chance to summon one of four horsemen whenever spending their runes. The TLDR with these is that one has Death and Decay, which will give the DK even more haste and cleave damage, one will cast Chains of Ice on the target, saving the DK a few globals, one gives some added strength, with the last one applying a brand new damage over time effect to the target. Ultimately, while very thematic and cool in concept, from a damage standpoint, all this tree really does is just passively enhance what Death Knight did already, with little to no impact on gameplay at all. 
Sure, they get slightly more sustained damage, and with Army of the Dead summoning all four riders, slightly higher burst on their goes, which obviously isn't a bad thing. I mean, they're still topping damage in practically every game with ease, but it just seems like such wasted potential. Anyway, speaking of class fantasy, it's always struck me as odd that Death Knights are meant to be the anti-caster class, yet anti-magic shell used to break almost instantly. Kinda ironic. Luckily though, Death Knights have seen significant improvement here, with new passives such as Null Magic, which provides a passive reduction to both the damage and duration of all magic effects. Vestigial Shell, enabling you to use AMS to support your team. Unyielding Will, causing AMS to now also remove magic effects when activated. And if this wasn't enough, they now even get Horseman's Aid, which causes your horsemen to also cast AMS on you. Combine all of this with the fact that they can now mount in combat, yes, you heard that right, mount in combat, Unholy Death Knight is overall in a slightly better position going into the War Within, earning them a solid a tier ranking considerably higher than their Frost counterparts. Moving on, no king reigns forever, and for you demon kings out there, things are not looking too good. Demon Hunter is one of the few specs with what's looking to be two equally as viable hero talent trees. First is Eldrachi Reaver, a tree that focuses on improving the strength of their spenders in order to bolster their sustained damage. Revolving around Art of the Glaive, a passive that converts your throw glaive to Reaver's glaive after picking up a set amount of soul fragments or by otherwise using the hunt. In turn, causing their Chaos Strike to debuff the target with Reaver's Mark, increasing all damage they take by 7% for 20 seconds, as well as also causing their next Blade Dance to strike three additional times. Depending on which one they use first, the effects of the second will then be doubled, meaning they'll be able to maintain a 14% damage increase on the primary target. Those of you that enjoy having your stuns, crowd control, or damage immune will enjoy this tree as well, as thanks to evasive action, demon hunters can now vengeful retreat a second time for a brief period after using the first, staying in the air for what seems like an eternity. The other tree, Felscard, is focused more so around buffing demon hunters' metamorphosis via a passive called Demon Surge. Now, anytime they use a metamorphosis enhanced ability, they'll also do some additional fire damage on top to anybody near. This is especially strong for their two minute meta, as Eye Beam, Immolation Aura, and Sigil of Flame also all get empowered for even more demon surge damage. While the tree may seem straightforward at first glance, top demon hunters are abusing this, using a special combo to maximize their damage with the new empowered spells, achieving the highest possible demon surge damage. And this exact sequence is one of many we cover in our brand new demon hunter class course for the War Within. Now, while this all sounds fairly interesting, the truth is that one factor has made the spec so dominant in solo shuffle for the past few seasons, and while Demon Hunter mains might try to convince you otherwise, it all comes down to one thing, the sheer amount of damage they can deal. And when a class designed around dealing damage is currently outputting less sustained DPS than a subtlety rogue, well, you don't need me to tell you that they're probably not in the best spot. Aside from just number tuning, something else that has significantly hurt Demon Hunters going into the War Within is the removal of Chaotic Imprint and the substantial nerf to Chaos Brand. These two passives allowed Demon Hunters to synergize exceptionally well with casters while in turn also boosting their own damage. But without them and the class remaining almost identical in terms of survivability and crowd control, bar a few new passives, they're ultimately shaping up to be in a much weaker spot. Let's just say it's a good thing Demon Hunter still has Glide, because without it, they'd definitely be taking fall damage from this placement, as we'll be slotting Demon Hunter right into our B tier. The same definitely can't be said for our next spec though, Feral Druid. Before we even begin to talk about anything new, there's one change for Feral that we're all excited for. Wild Attunement is now gone. We all hated playing against it. Feral mains even hated playing with it. Hell, it was so bad that it even caused some diehard Ferals to re-roll. At the end of Dragonflight, Feral Druid was somewhere in the middle of the pack. Although their damage was good, it was reliant on hard casting Cyclones. And casting on a squishy melee that gets trained every game? Well, it definitely wasn't all that fun. Heading into the War Within, Feral Druids on the beta were shaping up to be one of, if not the strongest melee specs. By selecting the hero talent tree Druid of the Claw, which enhances single target burst damage by boosting Ferocious Bite through the talent Ravage, and combining it with talents like Taste for Blood, Saber Jaws, and their tier set Ferocious Bite became one of the hardest hitting abilities in the entire game. Unfortunately, not only were both of these talents nerfed since then, but it also appears that their tier set wasn't being properly reduced in PvP as it should have been. Fortunately though, there's still Wild Stalker, which is now set to be the go-to choice. This hero talent tree focuses more on bleeds and features the passive Thriving Growth, which gives your bleeds a chance to cause vines to grow on the target, dealing additional damage. 
When combined with talents like Adaptive Swarm and Lunar Inspiration, along with the overall buffs to Bleeds to address the Ferocious Bite nerfs, it shifts Feral Druids back into that more Bleed-centric playstyle that a lot of Druid players love. And it's not only their damage profile that's changed for the better this expansion, Feral Druids are also seeing significant boosts to their survivability, an area where they previously struggled. With new talents like Oak Skin, additional survivability from various hero talents, and of course, there's now no longer the need to shift into caster form to continuously land Cyclones. All in all, despite the ups and downs, we're going to be slotting Feral into our A tier. Are they melee? Are they ranged? Who knows? Up next, Survival Hunter. Survival Hunter honestly feels like a time capsule. The world around it is changing, everyone is mewing and dissing Drake, but it remains exactly the same as it was in Dragonflight. Mainly because the current go-to hero talent is looking to be Sentinel, which causes their attacks to apply a stacking buff, with each application having a chance to trigger for some additional damage. Yeah, that's really it. Then the rest of the tree is just more passives, extra chance to apply stacks, cooldown reduction when a stack detonates, some free focus when a stack does damage, that kind of stuff. Funnily enough, aside from the passive damage, this one talent here alone is almost better than the whole entire pack leader tree put together. Crazy, right? Nonetheless, survival is still the same as ever. You've got pretty good sustained damage coupled with consistent and reliable burst windows thanks to coordinated assault. The only real noticeable change is that now they have even stronger crowd control. Previously, survival had to choose between scatter shot or binding shot and intimidation or high explosive trap. Now, they just get all four. Guess we're thankful CC got reduced after all. As for Hunter specs as a whole, Beast Mastery may as well just not exist, it's that weak. While between Survival, Marksmanship, MM is edging just slightly in front, and to even be comparable, Survival simply requires a lot more effort. Both in terms of how it deals damage and just the general playstyle, but if you're good at understanding when you should and shouldn't be in melee range, Survival has everything it takes to be very good right now. One tip though, make sure you're playing Diamond Dice. Call me old fashioned, but back in my day, abilities were either single target or AoE, and I'm not just talking Hunter here. But now, even more so in the War Within, every single target ability passively cleaves, and every AoE ability doubles as single target damage. Weird. Anyway, for the average player, Survival Hunter will find itself placed inside of our A tier. The better you are though, the more potential it has. Moving on! Up next we have Windwalker Monk, who have usually been pretty good in solo shuffle, but will they hold up? Before we even dive into hero talents, the first major change to Windwalker is the removal of Kiefer's Skyreach, a talent that previously monks heavily relied on. Playing a crucial role not only for the critical strike component, which was key in setting up their burst damage, but also for the mobility it provided, allowing them to stay glued to their target. To compensate, and help with some of their long-standing mobility issues, they now get Clash. Think of this as somewhere between a roll and a Death Knight's Death Grip, causing the monk and their target to meet them halfway, right at the borderline, in addition to rooting all nearby targets, offering a ton of playmaking potential. Overall though, while both hero talent trees are looking to be playable, it seems as if Conduit of the Celestials has edged out slightly in front. The key talent within this tree being Celestial Conduit, a channeled ability doing AoE damage to enemies around the monk. With the rest of the tree designed around summoning half of Mists of Pandaria to aid them in combat and provide the monk with various buffs. Ultimately, with the removal of Skyreach and Serenity, Windwalker monks are now more of what you, I guess, would call a bruiser, focusing on high consistent damage. Taking advantage of Storm Earth and Fire, which most notably are now immune to crowd control and roots, making them far more reliable in PvP. Don't get me wrong though, Windwalker can still definitely dish out some high burst damage on their pops, but it's just no longer going to be that complete one-shot we experienced back in Dragonflight, thank god. With that in mind, their main drawback seems to be a long-standing issue the lack of any reliable crowd control to close out games, a weakness that is even more apparent now with the nerf to paralysis. As a result, Windwalker monks are heavily reliant on maintaining consistent uptime, landing well-timed leg sweeps, and waiting for dampening in order to close out games, which if you're facing something like a Shadow Priest or Warlock can be very strong, but if you're facing a Frost Mage who just so happens to be the most dominant caster right now, well, let's put it this way, you're not going to be in for a very good time. And for these reasons, Windwalker Monk will be placed in our A tier, with A standing for average. They're not great, they're not terrible, they're just kinda meh. Next up, it's time to look at Retribution Paladin. Retribution Paladin is a spec that fundamentally has everything needed to perform well in solo shuffle, and the new hero talents are a great addition from a design perspective. Herald of the Sun enhances their sustained and cleave damage with a passive damage over time effect called Dawnlight, which is applied to targets whenever the Paladin uses Wake of Ashes. 
Then, when the Red Paladin activates wings, beams will link to any targets affected by Dawnlight, dealing damage to anyone they pass through. Better hope there's never two Reds in a single lobby, as if there's one thing I know about yellow beams, it's that you should never cross them. Then, there is what appears to be the stronger of the two, Templar, which places a greater emphasis on burst damage thanks to the key talent Light's Guidance, providing access to Hammer of Light, a powerful 5 holy power spender that can be used after Wake of Ashes. While this hammer already hits incredibly hard, there's a hidden interaction allowing Paladins to unleash two back-to-back -back Hammer of Lights. Just look at this damage. Curious how it's done? Well, this is just one of four different burst sequences we cover in our brand new Retribution class course on our website. Anyway, Ret Paladins, going all the way back to the game's inception, have consistently faced the same two issues. They lack damage outside of cooldowns, and they struggle to stay connected to their target. Blizzard more or less fixed the ladder in Dragonflight, but rather than, oh, you know, adding some extra mobility or maybe even a gap closer, they thought, why not just make everything ranged instead? In a similar roundabout fashion, instead of simply, you know, buffing Rhett's sustained damage or something, in the War Within, they decided to just give them Avenging Wrath all the time. Cool. As one of the new additions to their kit is Radiant Glory, which replaces Avenging Wrath and instead ties it to Wake of Ashes, meaning every 30 seconds they can Hammer of Justice, pop Wake of Ashes, in turn gaining Avenging Wrath and activating their hero talents, and then, well, they burst. Something even that human male Retribution Paladin in your solo shuffle is capable of pulling off. That said, even with this, Retribution is currently struggling with a lack of finishing power, and this is understandable, as the spec relies heavily on secondary stats like Mastery and Versatility to perform well, stats that are typically in short supply at the start of an expansion. So in order to compensate, we may end up seeing Rets forced to resort back to Crusade and neglecting Radiant Glory altogether, despite it being arguably the better of the two. Regardless, fundamentally on paper, Retribution Paladins are the ultimate solo shuffle spec boasting strong defensives, incredible carry potential through their utility and support kit, and very clear win conditions. And to be honest, at lower ratings, this still holds true. The main issue though, and as usual when it comes to retribution, the higher you climb, the more this clearly defined playstyle begins to hold you back. All things considered, we'll initially be placing Retribution Paladin inside of our B tier. Moving on to the first of our three rogue specs, we have what's shaping up to be the strongest of the three, Subtlety. While both their hero talent trees have merit, top rogues seem to be gravitating more towards Deathstalker. A tree revolving around Deathstalker's Mark Passive, a 3 stack debuff which is applied to the target by their first Shadow Strike after breaking Stealth or after using Shadow Dance. Any finishers used on the target will remove one of these stacks, and once all three are depleted, the rogue gains Darkest Knight, empowering their next Eviscerate for even more burst damage on setups. Deathstalker not only significantly affects how you want to be opening, but there's also new ways to optimize your burst sequence in order to fully take advantage of this proc for the ultimate one-shot, something that we covered in-depth inside of our newly updated class courses. Aside from that, the tree also brings some substantial improvements to Subtlety Rogue's sustained pressure through talents like Corrupt the Blood, as well as added survivability and mobility through nodes like Bait and Switch and Shadewalker. The playstyle remains fairly identical to what it was in Dragonflight, meaning they're still heavily reliant on their burst damage of Shadow Dance combined with their extensive crowd control kit in order to close out games. And to answer your question, yes, they can very easily 100-0 in a single stun. I mean, that's kind of the key metric for determining if Subtlety is performing well, isn't it? Only now, the noticeably higher sustained damage and added survivability encourages sub-rogues to play even more aggressive outside of these windows, making it possible to even maintain and carry momentum after setups are over, glossing over one of their long-standing weaknesses. And while many rogues were dooming over the nerf to Kidney Shot, it undeniably had the least impact on subtlety. As aside from hero talents, the War Within also brings hefty buffs to Invigorating Shadow Dust for even more cooldown reduction, and even buffs to Subterfuge for even longer stealth windows. Will Subtlety Rogue inevitably end up being the strongest rogue spec overall? Most likely, yes. However, as I'm sure Rogue Main will make sure to tell you, every time you talk to them, excelling on it demands a lot of game knowledge, knowing how and when to spot win conditions by triangulating your cooldowns with DRs, which in layman's terms means they hold Smoke Bomb or Shadowy Duel until you've pressed your trinket. Anywho, we firmly believe A plus is a good spot for sub, but depending on who's between the keyboard and chair, it has the potential to either climb or drop a tier in strength. Assassination Rogue, on the other hand, is the polar opposite. Imagine if you could hit escape, 
pause the game, and turn down the game difficulty from hard to easy. Well, that's basically what happens when you respec from subtlety to assassination. While the spec still shares a lot of similarities in playstyle compared to Dragonflight, still focusing heavily on sustained damage, poisons, and bleeds, the most notable changes going into the War Within are the removal of Shadow Dance and Night Stalker. While this was a significant hit to burst damage, it ended up being heavily compensated for with the buffs to Subterfuge and the addition of two Vanish Charges, with the only other real noteworthy change being serrated bone spikes now automatically getting baked into rupture. Most assassination rogues on the beta are gravitating towards the new fate-bound hero talent tree, centered around the key talent Hand of Fate. Though it may seem complex at first, this talent essentially flips a coin each time the rogue uses a finisher, with the goal of landing either heads or tails seven times in a row. If successful, the capstone talent Fateful Ending is activated, granting the rogue a 7% agility boost for the rest of the arena. To help achieve this, Vanish and Death Mark can be used to ensure they land on the same coin. While the tree's focus on passive damage buffs perfectly complements the assassination's playstyle, it's the Death's Arrival passive that really makes it shine. As this, combined with two charges of Vanish, not only makes it nearly impossible to kite the rogue, enhancing that Terminator-esque playstyle of theirs, but now also makes maintaining bleeds on multiple targets much easier. Oh, and obviously it's a huge upgrade to their special move and true solo shuffle win condition, the epic Shadow Step Kick. So, with better mobility, improved survivability, and increased sustained damage, Assassination Rogue firmly establishes itself as one of the top melee specs heading into Season 1, securing its spot in our A-plus tier. Which leaves the outcast of the Rogue family, Outlaw, up next. Now, to be 100% honest with you, Outlaw Rogue is just one of those really weird specs that you rarely ever see, and only people who have mained it for several years still bother to play it. It's not bad, it's not good, it's just honestly, well, just it sort of just kind of exists, I guess. Sure, a few specific players make it work in very specific comps at high ratings, but for Solo Shuffle, well, a good way to describe the spec is kind of like that annoying fruit fly that you keep seeing fly past your monitor all day, but can't really be bothered to get rid of. Doesn't really do any overly impactful damage, isn't really all that scary, it's more than anything just an annoyance. Going to the War Within, the only real direct change to Outlaw comes with the removal of Shadow Dance, now being replaced by two charges of Vanish. We can only imagine this change likely means even less burst damage coming out than they had previously. The general consensus from all three people playing the spec seems to be more in favor of Fatebound as the hero talent tree of choice, which makes sense with it being mostly focused on improving passive damage above all else. And you know, if you're gambling on your rolls anyway, you may as well double down and flip some coins in between. Ultimately though, from what we've seen thus far, the one thing we can say with certainty is that Outlaw is nowhere near the level of either sub or assassination, but we're not ruling them out entirely, as if there's one thing I know about Outlaw, it's that there's always potential. So we figured B tier is fair, but put it this way, we wouldn't be surprised if somebody like Trill comes along and ends up proving us completely wrong. Next up, we've got Enhancement Shamans, and oh boy, there's three certainties in life, Death, Taxes, and Enhancement Shaman being the worst spec in Solo Shuffle. Hello, Blizzard, how long has it been at this point? The good news, Enhancement Hero Talents are actually looking pretty good, with both having their own niche. Stormbringer is the more lightning-based tree, with various buffs to Maelstrom Weapon and Resource Generation. All in order to fuel the main hook of the tree, Tempest, requiring a lot of RNG and also uptime, but providing some pretty high burst damage. Whereas Totemic is more so built around improving Lava Lash, with the whole Lava Lash, Flame Shock, Maximum AoE Spread Damage build I'm sure Enhancement Shamans are familiar with. With the main addition here being the new ability, Surging Totem. Aside from hero talents, the only other real difference going into the War Within is the new Stone Bulwark Totem. A 3 minute cooldown absorbed for the Shaman and their team, which although very strong can easily just be purged, and of course, gets reduced by dampening. Bad news though, Enhancement still struggles with the same issues it's faced since the inception of Solo Shuffle. Their damage is lackluster, heavily relying on procs or continuous uptime for the majority of it to make an impact. They have no mortal strike healing reduction, making them highly dependent on the lobby to perform well. They suffer from noticeable mobility issues, and their crowd control is unreliable, to say the very least. With their only real niche, and I guess strength, you might not be able to tell, but I'm doing air quote marks here, continuing to be their powerful and consistent off healing. But in a bracket where dampening ramps up exponentially, well, yeah, I guess it's like if you were to build a house where all the tools, nails, and lumber are the new hero towns, but when built on a shaky foundation, it's always going to result in a disaster. Unfortunately, this leaves Enhancement Shaman right at the bottom of the totem pole going into Season 1. Finally, we have our two Warrior specs, starting with ARMS. The majority of what's new for ARMS Warrior doesn't necessarily change the feel of the class. It
it still plays exactly like you'd expect from that typical vanilla MMO warrior, having a straightforward but still action-packed rotation. If they can stick to their target, they can apply consistent, somewhat high pressure, which is ultimately the core strength of the spec. And with the current go-to tree shaping up to be Slayer, this strength has only been improved upon. Built around the Slayer's dominance passive, Slayer focuses on adding additional proc damage while marking the target, increasing the damage they take from executes. And it's improving both Execute and Bladestorm, which this tree focuses on, through various other passives like Unrelenting Onslaught, while additionally providing much more access to sudden death procs on top. And best of all, it grants even more mobility through the passive Vicious Agility. In Solo Shuffle, Arms Warriors bring what I can best describe as a Golden Retriever playstyle. They can swap targets and apply pressure to whatever you can hit, contribute to your setups with their low cooldown offensives, and sharpen blades. They provide multiple stuns whenever you need them. They even support you with tools like Intervene, Rallying Cry, and Berserker Shout when you need them the most. Honestly, it always just feels like they're there for you and bring good vibes all around. You just can't ever really go wrong with an Arms Warrior. So, where do they stand on the tier list? This is where it gets tricky. While they're solid, they don't truly excel in any particular area. And although they were already middle of the pack on the beta, Arms Warriors were inadvertently hit by the nerf to Thunderous Roar, which was primarily aimed at bringing Fury down a peg, which currently makes it hard to justify placing Arms Warrior any higher than B tier, at least for now. They're just missing that certain something, but is that a bad thing? Not at all. It's that special something that often gets nerfed, and when it does, Arms Warrior will be there, ready and waiting with open arms, pun intended. But until then, for the time being, it's all about our next spec, Fury Warrior. If Arms Warriors are the Golden Retrievers of Solo Shuffle, Fury Warriors are the Pitbull Terriers, the Attack Dogs. Gates opened, you send them on a target, and unless you're a highly mobile caster, well, I wish you the very best of luck. The fact is, right now, Fury damage is just insanely overtuned. One of the main reasons for this being the Slayer tree. This tree even more so is just perfect for Fury, as not only does it massively enhance their already high sustained damage through the various buffs to Execute and Bladestorm, it heavily incentivizes and benefits sticking to a single target, with the Slayer's dominance passive marking a target and causing Executes used on them to deal increased damage while also reducing the cooldown of Bladestorm. Which then, aside from doing ridiculous damage in itself, courtesy of Culling Cyclone, also applies the passive Overwhelming Blades for even more sustained damage on top. Throughout all of Dragonflight, one of the biggest issues with Fury, and part of what held it back, was the bug with the PvP talent Slaughterhouse. For those of you who may not know, Slaughterhouse is a ramping Mortal Strike effect that, when fully stacked to 12, resulted in a whopping 36% healing reduction. Previously, with the bug that existed, it meant that if there was another healing reduction effect in the game, the Fury Warrior couldn't even begin to build up stacks. Luckily, or I guess unluckily, depending on what you play, after two whole years, this has now been fixed. Meaning, not only are Fury Warriors already doing some of the highest sustained damage in the game, they're also doing it on a target that takes 36% less healing. Factor this in with how quickly dampening ramps in Solo Shuffle, and you're left with this situation where unless you're a spec that can get away, you're just going to inevitably die to their sustained pressure with very limited counterplay. Then if this consistent onslaught wasn't somehow enough already, Fury just so happens to have not one, not two, but five strong and relatively short cooldown offensives. Recklessness, Avatar, Thunderous Roar, the newly buffed Odin's Fury, as well as the new addition of Bladestorm. Truth be told, their only real weakness right now is their survivability, where although it's not weak per se, it's tied to healing, making it not exactly ideal for a format like Solo Shuffle. However, given the current state of their damage and healing reduction, the sad truth is, it's unlikely you'll reach a point where that weakness will even come into play. Anyway, needless to say, Fury Warriors will be charging straight into our S tier for the War Within Season 1. With Fury Warrior covered on screen now, you'll see our completed tier list for the start of the War Within Arena Season 1. Let us know what you think in the comments, do you agree? Trick question, of course you don't, it's the YouTube comment section. So instead, let us know what we did wrong and what you would change. Anyway, if you're excited for the War Within, Skill Cap's the place to be. We've spent the last three months on the beta, working side by side with some of the best players in the game, all to craft our brand new arena damage courses. Tailor made for you to skip the entire learning process and get ahead of the competition from day one. And that's not all, we've leveled up our revolutionary add-on with all of the latest updates for the War Within delivering you the ultimate PvP UI completely ready to go in just a few clicks. The best part, it's all completely risk-free. Simply use the link below, and if you don't achieve at least 400 rating with our service, we'll refund your money, no questions asked. So, for now, thanks for watching, and good luck in the new season. See you in the next one.